Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fourth evening broadcast at the 17th International Keyboard Institute and Festival in New York City, which this year is being held at Hunter College on, uh, on the campus of Hunter College in Kay's Playhouse. And this evening we will hear a performance by Magdalena Bajewska, who will be doing uh, the Goldberg variations of Bach, both on the harpsichord and on the piano, and it's going to be really very thrilling performance and something extremely very unique. And in also in a few minutes, uh, we will have the pre-concert lecture by David Duball, who always introduces the works and things like that. But first, I'm really pleased and very excited to have with me here today, Alessio Box. Hello, Edward. Uh, pleasure to have you, and this is certainly uh, not the first time you're at the International Keyboard um, Festival. It's always a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I, I was always struck, um, I've heard you many times, and reading your bio and everything, uh, you sort of, of, of the young generation pianists that are here and we're, we're hearing this season, that you epitomize everything that today's pianists have to deal with. You perform solo recitals, you play a lot of chamber music, you play with orchestras, uh, you teach. Um, I believe that's oh, very important. How, what is your feeling about, like I said, what the pianists really have to go through in some ways in their careers? Well, I don't know if one has to go through, through, through to try to do so many things, but I'm, I'm just, I guess, musically greedy, and <laughs> there's so much great music to play, so many great uh, people to play with. I mean, I would be very, very lonely and just to play by myself and, and to play recitals and with orchestra just on the road, and I think, I think there's so much to learn from other musicians, Absolutely. and th that's why the chamber music. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's something that I really want to do, and the repertoire, of course. I mean, exactly. how can you play Beethoven without knowing his chamber music, or Schubert mm -hmm. without doing knowing intimately its song, his song cycles, and so on? Exactly. Well, it's it's something that again a lot of students, because we are here at the International uh, Festival, and there are about 120 students from all over the world coming in to study. With uh, you gave a master class this this afternoon to students. And a lot of them sort of believe that if they just sit and practice by themselves, mm. uh, that's enough. And uh, if they just put in the hours, and of course we need to do that. We're, it's a very solitary type of profession that we're dealing with. But I always remember the words of Vladimir Horowitz who says that you must know all the arts. It's not just the piano music. I mean, if, if you're, you must know the symphonies, you must know the opera and chamber music. And this is all incorporated. And I think it's very important to pass this sort of knowledge to the students. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I feel exactly the same. And I have to say, as a student, I was also like that. And my priority was to uh, learn new pieces, to practice, to enter competition, and so on. I thought that was enough. And then, at some point, you reach, you reach a, a, a level where that's not... Just that's just not enough anymore. Mm -hmm. So y you need to find different ways and to keep challenging yourself with new projects and new ideas. And could be new pieces also going back to old pieces exactly. and, and, and uh, for example going back to a piece that I haven't played in 20 years but um, having done a lot of chamber music by mm -hmm. other composers and knowing other things about literature and art and you see it in different eyes and uh, it's very inspiring to, one, to oneself and it's very humbling too because it, it sh it's there to show how great the music that we play every day is exactly. much greater than, than us. Yeah, of course, absolutely. Um, a lot of times uh, as pianists we have such a huge amount of repertoire and try to pick, in other words, I always say that if we combine all the other repertoire together, of all the other instruments, I should say, it doesn't even come close to what we have to deal with. How lucky, <laughs> how lucky are we? In some ways very <laughs> lucky, but in some ways, the other ways, they always need us. So uh, I always say, you know, Beethoven wrote 10 violin sonatas, but 32 piano sonatas, yeah. and, and yeah. we have to learn them all. Um, how do you yourself balance with trying to learn new repertoire, especially uh, there's a lot of call for today. I mean, composers are always interested in having the worst performed, and we're sort of living in a century where a lot of times um, we're still looking back at the old masters, and I know the yeah. audiences especially yes. that we have are, are interested in hearing the old masters, but what is your view about maybe taking on a new composer? Do you, do you commission some works? Do you, do you perform uh, new music? I've, uh, I've worked with a lot of composers and first time. I mean, I, it's, it's, in a way, it's hard to know what will stay, what will of become course. classic. <laughs> and, but it was the same at, at the time of Mozart, and there were how many composers were writing during Mozart's time, exactly. and how many do we know today? Um, so the, you have to find 
composers and works they really speak to you mm -hmm. uh, they challenge you and they they satisfy you as a musician Absolutely. i mean I, very often i see um, new pieces of music in programs they're there just because they're new music <laughs> and that you know program is, is uh, i think was rubinstein they said it's like a menu it has to make mm -hmm. sense and i love when uh, um, when there's a connection with the new piece of music or there's new music that all in spite of being new has connection with the uh, with the great classical exactly. music, and that's something I personally respect exactly. very much. And that that's always uh, it's it's a big challenge, and we always say we're sort of the vehicles through which possibly the the great next Beethoven and Mozart will be, especially mm -hmm. if we're committed to the work that that will be. And in some ways, the composers today are relying upon us of as course, performers yeah. because in very the old important. days Mozart could play his own works, <laughs> and if he was going to do a concert, and Beethoven did the same. They they sort of played their own works, and they do rely upon us to do that. Now, tomorrow evening, you have uh, a great, for me, it's, it's a wonderful program, uh, but it's, it's works in some ways that are favored by audiences, and in some ways are, I, I, I actually, I don't remember last time I heard, for example, the first piece on the program is the famous, what was 27, number two, the Moonlight Sonata mm -hmm. of Beethoven. Uh, how do you feel always going back to a piece like that? That I mean, sometimes we even learn as children, and then eventually, and everybody sort of knows it, and everybody talks about it. It's, it's probably the most recorded <laughs> work, maybe after the Fifth Symphony. Yeah, but um, you're right. <laughs> when when have you heard it? Uh, lately well, in program. Exactly, in a program. You know, yeah. I had uh, someone come to me and said the cutest thing after a concert. It's like, I think you're the first professional pianist that I've heard <laughs> play. <laughs> it's not an easy piece, but somehow... It's a very uh, difficult piece. It's or or you have a lot of people thinking that it's over after the first movement. Exactly, you know? that's all. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's uh, such a great piece. And I have to say that we were talking about it before. It's a piece I played when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. And then going back after so many years and after so much that I think I've learned. or And it's very fascinating. It is. Uh, well, it's, it's a special piece. I mean, in the Beethoven output of we, we said there are 32 sonatas and there are two that he writes sonatas quasi una fantasia yeah. which which we don't uh, know why he did it and what in, in a way it's it's so unlike Beethoven and uh, so unlike any other sonatas yet you wouldn't mistake him for anyone else exactly you know, and then to me that's a testament of how great Beethoven was and this piece in particular mm. um, also I'm, I'm playing uh, Scriabin third sonata after that yes. and you know Scriabin is such a different composer than Beethoven but this third sonata is probably the most classical in form mm -hmm. as in four movements a sonata form yes. and, and so on and so you cannot pair it, just any Beethoven sonata mm -hmm. with it. You have to find one that is very special very unlike Beethoven and so s hopefully somewhere without trying to force a connection, mm -hmm. of course, because they're so different, but somewhere they, they meet in the middle. Absolutely. So that, that was the whole idea of it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, to provide a um, Russian bridge to the second half, which is Mussorgsky's exactly. uh, pictures and exhibition. Which is one of the great, great Russian So that works. was the idea <laughs> behind, behind yeah. the program. Um, I, I assume you've played Mussorgsky many times. Do you have a few times? I recorded recently uh, oh, the Mussorgsky and Scriabin, and um, a couple of years ago the Beethoven, the uh, mm -hmm. Moonlight together with the uh, Hammer Clavier, Clavier and some yes. transcriptions. Yes. So. And uh, for those of you that uh, are, are not familiar, Alessio's performance of the Hammer Clavier is one of the spectacular performances. I've had a pleasure of Thank hearing you, you live you here at the festival and, uh, of course, on the recording. And uh, there's even a wonderful video of you with uh, Master Berenboim uh, doing a movement of that on, on his yes, series. Yes, yes, it, um, uh, it was part of his uh, Berenboim Beethoven exactly. project where he recorded all the sonatas and exactly. gave classes to five, five pianists. Exactly, I think. it's a very fascinating. Again, another possibility to to hear exactly what we're doing here at the festival, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, we're we're dealing with uh, young artists, and this was a p opportunity uh, for five pianists. I mean, you as well as Lang Lang and, and yeah, some Jonathan Bass. Yes, exactly. exactly. So there's another possibility of, of to he to hear you play. So that's that's really wonderful. Um, as I said, this is. Uh, this festival is really a very special event in New York. The uh, 120 pianists that are gathered here to do all kinds of uh, playing themselves and trying to uh, get insight as much as possible from the quote unquote masters or performers that happen to play in the evening performances. Um, do you find like a lot of times that when we teach and that's another aspect i mean we always teach ourselves by being but actually when we work with students that there's another even learning for ourselves uh, about the pieces or things like that yeah, absolutely we play i mean just the fact that you have to formulate ideas and you have to adapt them on the spot according to someone's performance i mean I, if i have very strong ideas on a particular piece still i'm not going to give the same lesson mm -hmm. to different people 
Exactly. I mean, that's not uh, that's not the way I see teaching. So um, you have to react on the spot, and in a way, that's what you have to do during a concert. There are not two concerts that are alike. No matter what you're trying to do, you have to react on the spot. But but teaching, you have to actually put into words what 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 your thoughts are and kind of understand the psychology of and um, the psyche of of the student, mm -hmm. the, someone that most of the time you don't know. You exactly. Know I mean? So I find it incredibly fascinating and, and no matter how long I'm teaching during the day, I always want to practice after that. <laughs> exactly. It's, um, um, it's inspiring to see these young kids. I, I Today they were just, you know, I saw maybe 40 of them lining up <laughs> so excited to try to get a spot to to have a lesson. And that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what it's all exactly. about. Exactly. But uh, again, at the same time, just to hear the when the students play, I always find it interesting because uh, sometimes they will play pieces we know and sometimes it's pieces we don't play ourselves. And it's just to have the perception of what do you say about a piece that you don't play yourself and where do you draw the line and how do you perceive it. And it's, it's something that I, I think when you're dealing with students individually, like, like you said, uh, it sort of opens up your own ideas because it's like, oh, I wonder how I would because one of the things I always found uh, that some things are easy for us and they might not be as easy for the right. students and for the whatever way, the reason. Other and, and the other way around. <laughs> Very often. There are students, exactly, there are some students playing pieces that I say, exactly how are you doing this? <laughs> yes. Uh, but it's it's also to formulate how do you explain of what you want to do yeah. about this particular In a short, piece. limited time. So exactly. it's, yeah, it's about time managing as well, so it's, which we all need exactly. anyway. Um, one other thing maybe we can discuss is about the quote unquote time management. Uh, with, the, with a big career, uh, that, that you have, how do you find time to practice or do you sort of rely on... <laughs> now you have to, I mean, you have to make a priority, as you well know. I mean, there's, there's nothing can happen without, exactly. <laughs> without of course. practice at any level. I mean, it doesn't matter how many times you've played a program because, exactly. uh, you know, it just has to be 200% your performance to have a, an acceptable <laughs> level exactly. to yourself. At exactly. Least. Uh, and so, so I find, you know, time managing is you try to do and then life gets in the way all the time so right. you have to plan for yeah, that absolutely. as well absolutely well thank you so much it's, thank you it's thank been you a pleasure. pleasure and i think we're going down to have david dubal do a pre-concert lecture about the goldberg variations in bach so thank you very thank much you. thank you good evening my name is scotch and teal and i'm the assistant to the director for the festival we are honored to have david dubal here with us tonight as he's been with the festival since it first started, he's been with us all of the years, and we're honored to have him. Tonight, as he comes out, we get to hear him speak once again, and it's always a pleasure. You can hear him speak on Thursday nights on WQXR, Thursday nights at 8 p.m. for his program, Reflections from the Keyboard which repeats on Sunday nights at 10 p.m. He's happy to be here with all of you tonight. Please give a warm round of applause to Mr. David DeBall. And I'm glad to know that we're going to um, have a good night of music of one of the great masterpieces of the world. You can hear me perfectly? Yes. Okay. Um, Magdalena will do something that is really a wonderful feat. Not that it has not done be been done before, it has been done by Rosalind Turek at Carnegie Hall. She played with all the repeats though, so that's 80 minutes. And then there was a dinner break Everyone went to McDonald's, not on her, believe me. And then she played him on the piano with all the repeats. So it was 180 minutes of music. And what's interesting, of course, is to hear the two timbres of the harpsichord and the piano. Let's just take a look at if Bach liked the piano or he didn't. He didn't. It could not have been so remembered that he comes from a very different aesthetic system, one of counterpoint, and the piano is an instrument very peculiar because it was invented for the new secular age that was about to 
uh, burst on the world, especially with his younger son, uh, his oldest uh, of the first marriage, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, you can say the father of the sonata form, before Haydn. So I want to say that uh, when Bach first heard the uh, pianos that were built by his great friend Silbermann, he, he wasn't happy. He said, well, the treble doesn't sound, it's so hard to play. Well, of course, compared to the breathing on the harpsichord, he never could get used to it. And in the beginning, his friend uh, Silbermann, the great organ builder, there are 60, 60 of his great organs in, uh, in the different Germanies, and he, uh, as a hobby, wanted to make an instrument of inflection. There would be no romantic music. There would be no music as we understand it, in the sense even of orchestral music, without the piano. The piano is the primary instrument of making loud, soft, and so forth, with uh, everything in between. So Bach would not be interested in this. He's an organist, one way, so to speak, it makes one sound and the harpsichord is a plucked instrument, while the keyboard of the piano is a hammer instrument, and it was invented by Cristofori in 1711. Uh, unfortunately, there are no pianos uh, called Cristofori. He's the greatest single genius of instrument making that ever lived, for it's an absolutely revolutionary mechanism on all levels. And his own pianos were exactly, to this day, the same piano that exists uh, except for the pedaling system being different. When it gets to the Goldberg variations, because I have to speak less today because we must uh, have the tuner start working on it at, I think, 735? Sure. Something like that, or 737 or whatever. Uh, so we have to get this thing going. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it, though? It's credible. It's a princely instrument, and it held ground from 1500 to, uh, let's say, when Clemente and Mozart and Haydn were actually composing their piano sonatas. Uh, what I want to do uh, is, first of all, Matt, let us play three versions of variation 19 of the uh, Goldberg variations, the 30 variations, the aria, and the 30 variations. And we'll hear three different performances. One of Russian performance, very rudy, very uh, rustic almost, uh, played by uh, a legend and Stalin's favorite pianist, unfortunately, Maria Udina. Let's hear her first, Matt. <laughs> Now the second version of the uh, Goldbergs uh, played by Glenn Gould, 1981. It would be his uh, anti-penultimate recording.
And that was, I mean, so different that, uh, I mean, you wouldn't even know it's the same piece. Now we hear, and I could, I could know that's Glenn Gould if I were on Mars. Now we'll hear Turek or Turek, the great Rosalind Turek. Thank you, Matt, and that was really revealing because if we did them on the harpsichord, you would hear another uh, thing. In 1946, the Goldberg Variations made a sensation because Landowska, Wanda Landowska, who brought the harpsichord back into being, made a recording, and it is actually a landmark in the history of our knowledge of old or ancient music, as they once called it. The Goldberg Variations were hardly ever played in England by Harold Samuels. Uh, Buzzoni didn't play it himself, the greatest pianist after Liszt, until uh, 1917. And there were very few performances. They didn't really know what to do with the work. Then in 1955, Glenn Gould comes along and he makes a sensation. During that period, Turek was the great Bach exponent and she filled town hall with uh, many Bach recitals. And I think she felt, knowing her a bit, that uh, uh, Gould stole her life, her, her light, really. Uh, she, um, she, and while Gould always acknowledged the influence of Turek, but Turek was a, a woman that understood her greatness very well and didn't like the idea of anyone taking it away from her, and Gould did. We're going to also talk about that for a second, uh, how one performance can start defining a piece. Uh, one can call the work now, not the Goldberg Variations, my friends, but the Gouldberg Variations. And that's dangerous. Uh, and we'll see in a second a writer that I like very much, and he happens to be the director of Yale University Press, and I wanted him to come here, but he couldn't get in, because I wanted him to read from his novel called The Variations. As you notice, the title is similar to what we're talking about. Chicago Tribune called it, to call The Variations a book about faith is to say both too much and too little, because this beautiful, enthralling novel is about so many other things as well. And the, the author is John Donatich. D-O-N-A-T-I-C-H. It's in print, it's a new work, it's St. Martin's Press. I would say if you want to read a fantastic book about faith, about uh, a Catholic priest who is going through all the hells that Catholicism itself is trying to handle at this time, and an African-American pianist by the name of James who is um, studying the Goldberg Variations with his Italian teacher. The book is so beautiful in so many ways. So I want to thank John Donatich for sending it to me and also for being my friend. I wish he could have been here to meet you. 
Uh, I'm just going to read a bit from this uh, because it's uh, based on the Goldberg. He says, Bach reaches conclusions but is never conclusive. His compositions have a general infrastructure that is scalable, allowing for an infinite capacity for asking questions and posing problems. That piece poses so many problems to the keyboardist. The courage to ask such difficult questions rests on the confidence that they may in fact be answered, even as he recognizes that the more complex the structure of understanding, the more is revealed as hidden and inaccessible. In this way, a musical historian, musical historians have noted, Bach writes theology. Very interesting, of course he does. Uh, and then his teacher says, well, it's not just enough for you to uh, practice them, I want you to write about them, which I think many teachers should ask their students to write about the pieces of music that they are playing. It would be a very, very valuable thing. Anyway, so he does, this black American uh, pianist uh, student sits down, he writes the Goldberg Variations, A Life, and he says this, there is something of the heavens in it wrote Sir Thomas Brown in an epigraph that appears in the Shermer edition of the Goldberg Variations. At once, even before he looks at the first note, the pianist's expectations are not only heightened, but cautioned. We are put on notice to recognize something of divine origin here, except that there is also something suspect about the statement. A little detective work reveals that Sir Thomas Brown published the remark in 1642, a century before Bach set the piece to paper. So we learn that the cosmic dimension so commonly attributed to the piece has been retroactively applied first by the American harpsichordist Ralph Kirkpatrick in 1935. Nevertheless, the damage has been done. We have been set up. In fact, the Goldberg Variations has a much more modest provenance. It was not even called by its name until 1802, 52 years after Bach's death. In a biography of the composer written by the flutist Forkel, Bach himself published the Goldberg in a series of keyboard music that he called Keyboard Practice, and the composer himself says that it just consists of an aria with diverse variations for the harpsichord with two manuals. Forkel tells us of our debt to Count Kaiserling, Russian envoy to the Elector of Saxony, who brought his estate's harpsichordist, Goldberg, to study with Bach in Leipzig. The Count, who suffered from chronic insomnia, asked Bach to compose some clavier pieces that required Goldberg, quote, to spend the night in an adjoining room so that he could play something to him during this sleeplessness, end quote. The music, quote, should be of such a soft, somewhat lively ca character that he might be a little cheered up by this in his sleepless nights. Bach, wishing to sac satisfy his patron, decided on a set of variations and was, quote, handsomely rewarded with a golden goblet filled with a hundred louis d'or. There is, of course, much scholarship that disputes this lore. There is no documentary evidence of the work being commissioned. No official dedication on its published title page. No evidence that the then 14-year-old Goldberg even had the technical competence to play the piece competently, and no record of the Golden Goblet in Bach's estate inventoried upon his death in 1750. But the mythology survives nonetheless, a divinely inspired music for an insomniac count, a model of exquisite solitude, a piece of work to be performed through a night of the soul on demand for as long as it would take a count to forget his worries and fall asleep. Apocryphal or not, the tale belies certain ambiguities about the work and its historical legacy. How is it that a piece of music designed to soothe an insomniac's rest of nights has evolved into the very standard of musical intellectualism, an icon of artistic profundity, a masterwork of such complexity as to have bewitched musicians for centuries, a map of the logical and conceptual capacity of the enlightened mind, and for many, a key whole peak at the very nature of divinity. 
And this is all James, the black American pianist, writing for his teacher this. It's quite something. And then James swivels his chair around and he's thinking about it and on and on and he realizes that, well, I mean, uh, the English patient, the person played it as if the piano would be safe if one played Bach on it. Uh, the pianist movie, uh, every other movie today has the aria of the Goldberg Variations. If I hear another movie with that aria, I'm going to take the director and hang him. Anyway, what's the point is the fact that the piece now has such a currency worldwide that when Gould did his 1955 record, it made him famous in one sweep, a 22-year-old boy. Okay, now it goes on and on very interestingly, and then he says, James left off and went straight to his stereo. His romance with the Goldberg needed to reckon with the history of all the famed pianists who had tackled it. James studied the great recordings, the reverent precision of, in the harpsichord playing of Wanda Landowska, who reputedly chastised a colleague by saying, you play Bach your way, my dear, and I'll play him his way. And all the pianists who followed, Rosalind Turek's sober rendering, Kipnis and Arau, who played more expressively and romantically, amplifying the original dynamics. Arau, by the way, played it in 1935 in Berlin and never played it again because he said that the piano destroys the actual aesthetic of the uh, Goldberg. So it's all very interesting. And he uh, learned all Bach and he never played them again until a little late in his life, very late. Um, and so uh, amplifying the original dynamics of the piece and to come full circle, those more recent performers like uh, Schiff and many others who would subvert the pianism of the instrument itself in order to simulate the character of the original harpsichord. Quote, art should be given the chance to phase itself out. What a perfect Glenn Gould statement, huh? We ex must accept the fact that art is not inevitably benign, that it is potentially destructive. Think about it. We must analyze the areas where it tends to do least harm, use them as guideline, and build uh, into art a component that will enable it to preside over its own obsolescence. Glenn Gould quote. For years, James was obsessed with the Canadian maverick pianist for the aesthetic model he presented, for the way style was indistinguishable from proficiency, for his mathematical yet capricious sense of time, the way, the, goal, the way he spurned live performance in favor of the manipulated precision of the recording studio, for the way he vocalized along and conducted himself, his nose nearly touching the keys, for the way Glenn Gould treated the pieties of art as religious heresies needing to be snuffed out. And Gould was a revolutionary character, believe me. Gould was a charlatan, this writer says, uh, John says, and a genius, and he had that charlatan in him. I talked to him 12 times in my life after 12 o'clock midnight when he always called, that's when he called, everyone, and I can tell you this is one of the greatest actors the world has ever known as well as a genius. So he was a charlatan and a genius and it perpetuated the perfect hate crime of the preemptive interpretation. He took poor Turek and Landowska, who thought they owned it, and he owned it more. A kind of terrorist act against the original to make it is his, is his own. To set the standard, the mother of all future interpretations. That's what he wanted. That which must always be reckoned with every time a pianist sits down at the keyboard. I, Juilliard, everyone, anyone ever plays Bach, that's all they think about is Glenn Gould. They're obsessed with him. Obsessed. My own assistant, uh, Ben Laudy, he's so obsessed with him that, you know, he's been working on the Goldberg for three years and he just can't get Gould out of his mind. Every future version then would have to refer back to Gould, whether in homage or disdain or correction. Now, except that wasn't how it turned out. Angela Hewitt, Andra Schiff, Murray Pariah, Simon Dinerstein, and so many others recorded gorgeous, rational, non-ideological non versions in the next room 
as the hysterical howls of Glenn Gould faded into legend. This is very important because the fact is, is once you get a hook on a work, Horowitz did it all the time, I would say, you know, uh, Anton Curity plays your, uh, uh, the, the scherzo uh, of, of uh, Mendelssohn, the scherzo a uh, uh, capriccio. What do you mean he plays it? Only I play it. You, you tend to start thinking as you live with pieces that they're yours. And certain people that have such tremendous personalities, they really do. They know that it's in the public domain, but they can't bear it. And that's my message today. This novel is so much more than what I just said by John Donatich. It is so filled with, with, number one, incredible writing, and number two, of a complexity of our society that I think you will love to buy it. It's very simple to buy it. I bought it at Columbia University uh, Bookstore. Store. I'm taking my vodka out with me. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Edward Zilberkant, and I'm joined here by Nina Tishman. Uh, and we are here at the 17th International Keyboard Institute and Festival in New York City, which is being brought from Hunter College in the uh, uh, in the concert hall here, uh, K Concert uh, Playhouse, and we just heard David Dubal do a pre-concert lecture uh, about the Goldberg Variations, and this evening we will have a performance by Magdalena Bachevska of the Goldberg Variations on both the harpsichord and the piano. And it's always fascinating for me, uh, when we play Bach today, number one, we always make as pianist transcriptions of, of what we're doing. Um, what do you feel, uh, how do you feel about the idea of, number one, should Bach even be played in concerts? Because he never really imagined it to be done that way. Uh, and number two, the fact that we're always transcribing. Well, you know, it's quite interesting because um, Busoni actually once said that everything we play is a transcription because everything is a, is a transcription of the idea of the piece into uh, material, sound. Mm -hmm. So if you start at that point, the question is either we play or we don't play. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, some people actually say that I'm not one of them, mm -hmm. that reading a score is the best way to appreciate music. But of course, that eliminates the senses. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, ag and again, that's, that's so, so true because even when we play Mozart, in many respects, mm -hmm. we, he doesn't have our instrument that we have mm -hmm. and Beethoven and everything else. So we are always transcribing. But it is interesting, especially today, to hear the Bach on two instruments side by side. The Goldberg Variations will be played first on the harpsichord and then on the piano. Not only will we have uh, those that with sensitive ears as far as perfect pitch will hear a different pitch right. because yeah, the harpsichord is, is basically yeah. tuned at least a half step lower mm -hmm. than the modern concert grand. And then everything else that, that is going to be happening, uh, it's, it's, it's a very unique, unique prospect of what's happening. It's quite an undertaking. I mean, I'm really just impressed at the idea that Magdalena is going to do this because um, it, it's such a different animal. I mean, playing on the harpsichord, I was so curious how she's going to handle that. Exactly. The, the uh, agogic things that she'll do and all the, I'm just, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. And also for, for listeners, it's also going to be very interesting yeah. because obviously piano is one of these instruments that we have pedals, mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. uh, different dynamics we can mm -hmm. really do, and people always say, well, harpsichord doesn't have dynamics. Well, I think this evening people will realize that harpsichord has a tremendous amount of dynamics, yes. Yes. but what we, at least some of the limitations of the harpsichord, if we can call it that, mm -hmm. uh, is the fact that pianists really have to deal with textures of articulation, mm -hmm. of register. This is going to be played on two manual harpsichord, mm -hmm. so there are, there are certain manipulations that will have to be done, and again, that is, this is something very interesting. It's, I think it's very interesting for pianists to study historic instruments anyways. I mean, I think it's Absolutely. fascinating. Absolutely, and actually one of the interesting things is, um, is the things that you learn technically. I think um, I, I was never able really to uh, um, identify with the argument that you have to hear the old instruments in order to know what kind of sound the composer meant. Because I, my feeling is either you understand what kind of sound the composer meant because you're a musician or you don't. 
and hearing the old instruments of course can give you a little kick but basically mm -hmm. be exactly. but when you start to play the old instruments and you begin to understand what you have to do with articulation and you transfer that onto a modern instrument that's a revelation exactly that's a revelation exactly yeah. well as i said we're here at the 17th international keyboard institute festival in in new york city and it's it's really a fascinating event for basically two weeks uh new york sort of becomes a mecca of, of piano. Every night there's a different concert by a different renowned pianist uh, here. Uh, you will be performing just uh, next week, in, in yep. next week uh, a really interesting program of Schubert and some Debussy. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us some, a little bit about your program and what you're well, going to be actually, doing? Well, um, actually, I'll be playing the first book of Debussy, Preludes, and the Schubert G Major Sonata. And as has often happened to me, I mean, these are two composers who are very dear to my heart. That's, of course, why I'm playing them. But as has often happened, I intuitively picked this program, also playing the Debussy first, mm. and as I began practicing the pieces next to each other, I began to discover all kinds of relationships that are echoed, where the, where the uh, Debussy echoes the Schubert, oh. tonal relationships, oh, uh, in, uh, all kinds of things. I was really astonished. I mean, I knew they were going to fit well together, but I began to understand why. Oh, that's yeah. great. That's great. Yeah. Um, and again, this is this is something that is really wonderful at the festival because mm -hmm. uh, students who are, there are about 120 students from all over the world, and they are able to come here. Not only do they take lessons with all the teachers here and all the pianists that are performing on the evening concerts, but they also get to interact. And they also get to hear every night mm -hmm. this incredible repertoire. And yeah. some of it they might not have heard. Some of this they might not have had an opportunity to hear in, in this type of guise. And again, I think students often study Debussy Preludes mm -hmm. uh, individually. I know as, as young students, there are some which are appropriate for younger students. Right, exactly. But to have them all as a cycle, uh, the, the complete uh, first volume, for example, to play is really wonderful to well, hear. Well, actually, the, the, the preludes, the, especially the first book, work unbelievably as a cycle. It really is a cycle. And I have to say something that will probably startle people, but I've been playing the Goldberg Variation since I was 15 years old. Oh. And there is something about the Debussy preludes, although I'm not putting them quite on that pedestal, mm -hmm. there is something about the uh, cycle of emotions that they go through. And also the way he ends with this very jocular, down-to-earth minstrels, mm -hmm. which is a little bit like the way Bach comes back to the quadlibet exactly. at the end. So there's something about um, going into spiritual realms and then coming down to earth. You know, Bach was such a, a mensch. Exactly. He was such an earthy person. And there's, there's a, an element of that in the WC, I think. Absolutely. Which fascinates me. Yes. And, and again, every night that as we continue the uh, the broadcast, mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be a different pianist playing different tomorrow night. Alessio Box is going to be playing an interesting program of Beethoven Moonlight Sonata, something that, mm -hmm. again, I think everybody knows. And so many people, if they ever study piano, the first movement of the Moonlight right. Sonata is sort of in their repertoire. But I would venture to say a lot of them never touch the second or third <laughs> movement of that piece. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, Scrabin Third Sonata he's doing and pictures in an exhibition. Um, and then we will have also Victor Rosenbaum mm -hmm. uh, later on in the week, who will also play the last three Beethoven sonatas. So there's also a lot of Beethoven under, uh, being played, playing 109, 110, 111. Mm -hmm. So there's enormous amount of uh, material and opportunity for people to hear really master uh, repertoire mm -hmm. that we, uh, again, we love it, we live with it, we, we perform it, but to hear it, live in concert right. and in this period of time of, of, of two weeks it, New York really does become a mecca. Absolutely, sort of it's, it, the festival is absolutely unique in this respect um, and it's unique for New York City which is really quite something because so much is going on in New York but not like this and I think it's also quite extraordinary that um, there are pianists of every different type and all nationalities. It's not, um, it is not like a, a, a line, mm -hmm. you know, party line. Exactly. We have Russians, we have Frenchmen, we have Italians, we have Americans. I mean, it's, it's really a chance to hear all different styles of playing, all different kinds of personalities. Exactly. Um, now, you, you live in Cologne. Yes. Uh, you're originally from New York, I'm I guess. I'm from New York, from Manhattan. <laughs> Manhattan. <almost. laughs> uh, but you live now in Cologne, mm -hmm. and you're a professor at the famous conservatory yeah. there in Cologne. Um, how do you find teaching for example, in, German or in Germany or in Europe, 
compared to what might be happening in the States or in other, and some of the students especially, that you encounter, especially in these masterclass situations that we deal with in, at this festival? That's, that's an interesting question. I, it's kind of difficult to generalize because, of course, teaching in a, in a masterclass situation where you see somebody once or possibly twice mm -hmm. um, is quite, quite different. Um, I don't even, I don't know, really know where to begin with this, you know, to answer that question, but I will tell you something rather amusing. Um, when I first started teaching in Germany, and I would talk to my students about something that was going on harmonically mm -hmm. in the piece, and I would say, but look, this is, this is the parallel minor. You know, we were playing this in C major, and this is now C minor, and it's the parallel minor. And they looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> they didn't understand what I was talking about, but the reason was, because in Germany, what we call the parallel minor, they call the relative minor. I see. And what we call the relative minor. <laughs> oh my God, totally <laughs> So <laughs> it took about 15 years for me to figure out, <laughs> figure out how that I had been using completely wrong terminology. I see, so they were looking at you like, yeah. why is she saying this really? to us? Yeah. So that's, that's what you're saying. But again, that's that's something, again, very unique here, and I know my personal experience of, of enjoying is working with students that they come, like you said, from all different backgrounds. Yeah. They come from different schoolings, some of, I mean, we have uh, people studying in, in Europe, in, in Russia, in mm -hmm. China, mm -hmm. in, in, in Japan, everywhere, and they all have different perspectives on music, yes. and there are some people with incredible technical facilities, and some which are tremendously musical, and are trying to find their way mm -hmm. into music, and I think this festival and what they get to meet with all the mm -hmm. artists here gives them an opportunity to see what real world sort of, of music of what they're trying to do is going to be all about. Absolutely, absolutely. And I particularly appreciate uh, when I have somebody come who's 15, 16, 17, you know, there are quite a few of these really talented mm -hmm. teenagers, and um, of course they're very influenced by the teachers they've been studying with, but there's a whole world here that can be opened up to them of other possibilities. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, Well, we're right now waiting here to begin of the concert with Magdalena Bachevska, who's going to be performing the Goldberg Variations for us, and the harpsichord is being tuned. She's first going to be playing it on the harpsichord, and then she will transfer to the piano in the second half mm -hmm. and play the entire set again um, on, on the piano, even though without the repeats. <laughs> uh, it's, it's as Mr. Duval stated so eloquently, it's probably one of the pinnacles of, of pianist repertoire. Mm -hmm. um, Bach, I find, personally, both listening and, and and playing to him, it's it's great for the soul. It's great for the mind. It's great for the fingers, uh, and but a lot of times audiences will be. I mean, there's there's obviously been a period of time when he sort of was forgotten. It was not mm -hmm. until Mendelssohn mm -hmm. that he was revived, mm -hmm. and now we obviously have a new revival. Many times with so especially interest in historical instruments yeah. and performances mm -hmm. on original with with groups playing on original bows and, mm -hmm. and interesting things. Um, I always found it fascinating that especially Bach mm -hmm. that most of his compositions were not written for concert hall the, ba the mm -hmm. major works of his are choral works and cantatas and things like mm -hmm. that were for church and then the keyboard works as we know in the well-tempered clavier the partitas he actually called them uh, exercise. little pra exercise, exercise books yeah, exercise so books. and uh, do you do you find uh, either when you're working with students or when you play yourself a separation, or, or how do you approach yourself the works of Bach when you play them in public? Or well, it depends, of course, on what one is playing, and it depends on on where you're playing. I find that, as in many with many different kinds of repertoire, um, it's often quite helpful for the public if you say a few words about the piece, possibly why you're playing the piece, or what it means to you, or point out certain things to them that might make it more interesting for them to listen to. Um, I mean, I love Bach, so it's very difficult for me to um, relate to somebody mm -hmm. not loving Bach. But one of the great experiences as a teacher, I mean, really great experiences, when, pe when students come in and they, they, they have no relation to Bach. They don't understand it, and they think they don't like it. You know? And then you sit down and show them how it, how it works, mm -hmm. explain it. And I have had so many students who have fallen in love with Bach. Mm -hmm. And it's, of course, that will change their musical lives, because everything we do if you, it is, comes from, from Bach. Yes. I mean, everything, oh, counterpoint, exactly. harmony, everything. So once a student really tunes into that, they have a, they've developed a certain basis for the rest of their musical lives. Mm -hmm. And this, this particular piece is really an incredible example mm -hmm. of, of this type of thing. I mean, you've, you've played the piece and you probably can talk more about it. 
uh, these variations are mm -hmm. built in a very unique way. We have obviously the aria, which mm -hmm. he starts mm -hmm. out with, and he eventually comes back to that mm -hmm. at the end. But throughout the variations, he has these canonic forms right. that right. he does a canon at a unison, mm -hmm. at a second, at right. a third, at a fourth, all the way, all the way through. Up, up to, to the, the ninth. ninth. Yeah. And, and it is absolutely amazing how the same idea and same motive, and this is so the genius of Bach, mm -hmm. that what he was able to do, not only in the Preludes and Fugues and things like that, mm -hmm. but the way, the counterpoint, that he demonstrates right. what can be done. Right. Although I actually find that when it comes to uh, introducing a student to counterpoint in Bach, that there's not, the Preludes and Fugues um, are, the, are the ultimate, because mm -hmm. the, um, the Goldberg variations, um, they're a very playful piece, actually. M much of the Goldberg variations are, are really very, um, very lighthearted. Not mm -hmm. all of them, obviously, but um, and the the actual nitty gritty of how a fugue works. There's not even a real fugue in the Goldberg variations. Mm -hmm. So there's a little fugetta. Exactly. But if you want somebody to understand how a fugue works, um, then the Goldberg variations is not the mm -hmm. piece you would go to. But of course, the thing that about the Goldberg variations is that the, the uh, constant in the Goldberg, Goldberg variations is the bass line. Mm -hmm. So he's got a license to steal with everything else. Exactly. And he does. Exactly. <laughs> you know, he just goes crazy yeah. with all the different dance forms and the t and the toccatas and the canons and yeah. just, you know. Absolutely. There's everything in there. Exactly. And including the kitchen sink. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and you will hear that. The kitchen sink is in the quad <laughs> Uh, well, the interesting thing about hearing the Goldberg variations on the harpsichord mm -hmm. and then eventually the piano is that, and even hearing a little bit when uh, Magdalena was, was practicing, mm -hmm. is that we are so used to, in many respects, to the piano, which mm -hmm. is very clear and pure. Yep. And harpsichord is not. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a very loud instrument. It was a very popular instrument, and mm -hmm. it's the reason why Bach really originally did not care for the piano when mm -hmm. he first heard it, that it was hard for him to play. It mm -hmm. didn't have the projection and everything else. But one of the things I think the audience will notice is that some of the lines that we think we hear very clearly, I, I think, for example, the opening aria yeah. on the harpsichord mm -hmm. is probably the most beautiful thing you can ever hear. Yeah. It is just such a unique sound mm -hmm. and what Bach creates. But some of the more boisterous mm -hmm. uh, variations that you will hear, there is so much mechanical right. noise and right. the overtones and the way the harpsichord is produced yes. that you will actually, when you hear on a piano, you'll say, ah, that's what it sounds like because it just sounds <laughs> like a real mess in many right, respects. Right. Well, the, the as the texture gets thicker, exactly. that's when the excitement builds up. But I mean, it's just, you have to get behind the instrument and behind the notes, and then you, and then you find the, the core of the piece, which has exactly. to be realized in a completely different way on the harpsichord. But the harpsichord is it does have this sort of raucous, boisterous aspect exactly. that actually we sort of have to avoid when we play Bach on the piano exactly. because then it sort of goes awry. It's yes. no longer anywhere near the style. Yes, and it's something very interesting that Magdalena will have to contend with, and that is the difference of touches. Yeah, that we I are think that we are That's very much, as pianists, we're dealing with weight mm -hmm. and because we play mm -hmm. piano, whereas on the harpsichord, it's everything opposite. Yeah. And in, in many respects, those of you that are studying piano and things like that, the initial technique that we teach people mm -hmm. is actually harpsichord technique. Nice yeah. curved fingers, <laughs> right. everything comes up everything from the, nice, fingertip, from the yeah. fingertips, and you, you mm -hmm. bring it up, and everything's very even. Whereas on the piano, as we know, as, as, especially as we get into the romantic area, yeah. the hand opens up, right. and, and right. we're sort of digging in. Yeah. And it's a very different approach. Yeah. And Absolutely. Of course, you have uh, pianists like Glenn Gould, who made a very famous concert effort that he was able to transfer, I think, the harpsichord type of technique when he plays on the piano, because he has a very digital type of Right, approach. but interesting it was he wasn't really capable of doing the other. Exactly. I don't no. think he played the harpsichord, but he... Did. No, I mean, he wasn't, he, went, he didn't no. really play... Um, he didn't really use that other kind of technique exactly. for other pieces. Exactly. You know. Yes, but, the, but for the box. Which, so, which might be, I mean, a reason that some things were very successful in a recording yeah. studio, but might not have been exactly in a concert, in a concert, in a hall. In a concert yeah. hall for him as well. Well, again, we are. I'm sitting here with Nina Tishman, who a professor at the Cologne Conservatory, and we are at the 17th International Keyboard Institute and Festival in New York City. Um, and we're at Hunter College in K Playhouse, where we're about to, in a few minutes, have the performance of the Bach Goldberg Variations by Magdalena Bachevska, who is going to be playing them on the harpsichord and on the piano. And again, during this two weeks, uh, there are pianists from all over the world who are going to be performing different recitals and different performances. Um, tomorrow, as we said, Alessio Box is, is playing a recital. Then we have Jeffrey Swan. Mm -hmm. um, there are many competition winners. There are many uh, uh, 
old uh, generation pianists uh, generation. who are who are coming. There are some younger pianists. And we're uh, going to have a concert with an orchestra. There is which for the you first are going time. To conduct? Yes, for the first time right. this year, uh, Jerome Rose created the Jaeger Meister Chamber Orchestra. And those that you understand, Jaeger is a hunter, and that we're in Hunter College, so the, hence the Jaeger Meister Chamber Orchestra. And it's uh, <laughs> the members of the orchestra are really some of the top notch players in the, in New York um, and it's about a 20 piece orchestra and That's it's going to be a very interesting concert of three piano concertos. Right. We're doing uh, Mozart uh, early K414 the A major concerto with Massimiliano Ferrati playing and then we have the Haydn D major concerto which again is probably one of the most popular uh, concertos with uh, students especially right. love to play this it's one of the great early concertos for students but in the hands of Matei Varga, it's it's such a brilliant and exciting piece. And of course, there's an incredible recordings both by Evgeny Kisin and Marta Argrich, right, right. who play that piece absolutely magnificently. And then the uh, second half, uh, the last part of the concert will be the famous Ninth Concerto, probably one of the earliest great big Mozart concertos, um, with played by Claire Huang Si, mm -hmm. and that's the number nine, the E flat de Genome, yeah. K271. And we're getting the signal here that we're almost ready for the concert to begin and again I thank you very much for it's joining pleasure. me today it's this uh, this was really a pleasure and again we are at the 17th International Keyboard Institute Festival and during the intermission I invite you to between the Goldberg variations Jerome Rose will be here with Jeffrey Swan and he will perform uh, he they will have an interview uh, discussing the works that he's going to be doing Jeffrey Swan has a big festival in Italy mm -hmm. and he is uh, performed many, many times, and he's one of the artists that has returned many, many years mm -hmm. to the festival here and has performed, and you've performed here I, on, yes, on a number of occasions, and it's always a pleasure to hear you mm -hmm. here in the concert, and you will be performing here in, in just next week the with, with, uh, with a, a couple of pro great program of Debussy and Beethoven, and again, we are just waiting for the beginning of the concert, and they're telling us any moment now. We're still, I guess, waiting for everybody. Lights There's a dimming. great, yeah, the lights, uh, are the lights are dimming and a lot of people are interested in this particular concert. So there's a slight delay in the beginning of the performance, but it's very, very exciting. But thank you very much and we hope to see you at our mission.
We would like to take a moment to remind you that the taking of photographs and the use of recording devices are strictly prohibited. In addition, please be sure that your cellular telephones and electronic pagers are turned off at this time. Any use of these devices inside the theater is prohibited by the City of New York. Thank you. so much for coming. I promise I won't be long. I just uh, wanted to say a couple of things uh, before I start because we have students in the audience. Um, you know, it's very easy to forget that most of the music that we know and love today has not been written for the grand piano as we know it today, and such is the case with the Goldberg Variations of J.S. Bach. So what I would not want you to walk out with tonight is the feeling of uh, competition for your preference between the two instruments, but rather enjoying the beautiful sound of this gorgeous instrument brought here by the Zuckerman team. Who, for, to whom I am internally grateful, and uh, just being transported into the world of sound uh, that inspired Johann Sebastian Bach in 1741 to write his masterpiece. Thank you.
Hello, this, I'm Jerome Rose, the Artistic Director of the International Keyboard Institute and Festival. And I'm uh, delighted that we've just heard the harpsichord performance of the Goldberg Variations played by Magdalena Bashevska. I have with me, sitting next to me, the great pianist Jeffrey Swan, and I'm delighted that he is in the festival. He is performing this Thursday night, and he's coming here early because he has to have a night off tomorrow night. Jeffrey, welcome. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. This is my, I think, 14th time at the IKIF, and it's a thrill and a pleasure and exciting to be here. And um, great programs, bigger and bigger audiences, more and more kids, higher and higher quality. Je Jerry, you're just going from triumph to triumph. Well, you're, you're, you're a great asset. Now, there, there are many things that, when you're putting on a keyboard festival, that I find very curious. And one of the things, we've known each other many, many years, and wait for my question, because one of the things that has always intrigued me is the development of a pianist, and this is so very much important, especially for we Americans, because we, in a sense, represent so much the high point of European culture. Two things happened when I first met you. You had mentioned Alexander Uninsky, one of your very first piano teachers. You were a, a boy from Arizona, and you were in Texas, and two things Uninsky insisted upon, upon studying. He said, one question he asked you, do you know the theme of the Eighth Symphony? That's and right. the second thing was, you need to learn French. That's and those right. are two things that stuck in my mind, because how many pianists of the world are Im imbued with this kind of knowledge and culture coming from such a wonderful pianist as Alexander Uninsky. Would you comment on that now? I think that's a very good, I'm, I'm very impressed. We, we met at Bowling Green. I played my first time at Clavier. Um, I think that we forget that the greatest musicians from Europe came to the United States. People like Uninsky who came as a, basically as a war refugee, World War II. Um, others who came for economic reasons, for political reasons, and really the greatest came here with a very, very strong sense of passing on this legacy of culture. And, and, and someone like Mr. Uninsky, yes, he was a great piano teacher, and, and, and I learned to play the piano, and, but I learned about what it is to be a, a, a man of culture. And, and learning foreign languages, the importance of the world, and the importance of, of, of and um, these are invaluable things. I mean, I, I am a firm believer that when you play a piece of music, everything you know, everything you are, everything you've lived, all your experiences, somehow in some magical way, um, serve. I mean, they're part of it. They're, they're, they're some kind of a foundation. And, and, and I was lucky enough to get that right from the age of 11 from Mr. Uninsky. Well, the, the simplistic phrase, you play who you are, is absolutely applicable, and, and this is, of course, witness, you know, witnessed all the time. And that wonderful age of, you know, this ubiquitous American culture that spread across the world, and this was a magnet towards this European culture that you and I, we were the great inheritors of. Yeah, this. My 50s, teacher, 60s, yeah. Yeah, my teacher, Leonard Schur, of course, left. He was a precursor to uh, the, 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 what was it, the debacle of Europe, and uh, was an assistant of Arthur Schnabel. And I was very grateful for this. Uh, my first teacher, Adolf Baller, one of my early teachers, also fled the war. And we, we have this great European tradition, sure. this great uh, culture. I think even at Juilliard. I mean, after Mr. Uninsky, I came and studied at Juilliard through the 70s. And who were the great teachers at Juilliard? They were all people who studied either in Europe, like my teacher, Beveridge Webster, studied at the Conservatoire in Paris, or, or Rosine Levine, or people who had studied with people like Rosine, Joseph Levine, or, or, or Schnabel, or Del, yeah, and and Gornitsky. and you know this. And I remember when I first started playing in Europe, people all said, "Oh, the American school. What is this American school?" And I said, "What do you mean American school? The American school are the best parts of the Europeans who've come to America." I, uh, you know, I think that there was a, 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 a misunderstanding and an underappreciation of just. What a, a fantastic... What a rich culture. Yes. Well, we just finished the Tchaikovsky competition, and of course, who was that great Russian pianist that won the first competition? None other than Van product Clyburn. of Rosina Levine, yes. Van, Van Cliburn. He played more like a great Russian pianist than anybody on the stage. That's right. And this is one of the... This is, this is always amusing to me because this American piano style is really a conglomerate of all the great artists that came here and taught. That's right. This... Uh, the, um, one of the things that I think people really, really forget is that whereas in certain aspects of popular culture, maybe um, 
America seems like something different from Europe. But even then, there was this tremendous cross-fertilization. But in, the, in, in classical music, because of the war, just think who was here during World War II. I mean, out in L.A., everybody was here. And, and, and they left an enormous imprint. And um, actually, I think Europe was something of a wasteland in the 50s and 60s. And the proof of that was when I was doing competitions in the 70s, like at the Queen Elizabeth um, in 72, I think eight of the 12 finalists were from America, were studying in, with, you know, in America. And I, you know, the, same, the same was true when I won the Bozzoni competition. Mm -hmm. the, the winners were basically Americans. Yeah. Uh, or those who had actually been studying in, in the United yeah. States. Well, of course, times change. I would like to talk a little bit about what your program is going to be this Thursday mm -hmm. night. And of course, one of the most important parts of this program and this unique piece that you are playing are the Hungarian portraits mm -hmm. of Franz Liszt. And you yourself are a great Listian. I love so to play Liszt. Please uh, mention this because I was looking this up and indeed Laszlo Teleki, who had a terribly tragic death, was a relative of Paul Teleki, who actually did commit suicide upon the invasion of Hungary during 19, in 1941. So there is a cross, you know, cross fertilization of these great Hungarian families. So well, mention that. Okay, well, I will. I mean, th th these pieces, there's seven of them, I'm just playing three, are uh, in Liszt's very late style. And Liszt, of course, had written a lot of Hungarian music earlier, but it was really sort of popular music. It was based on gypsy tunes, on popular tunes. But late in his life, he became really fascinated with true ethnic Hungarian music, very much foreshadowing Bartok, who adored Liszt and knew this music. And Liszt decided to write these pieces in honor of seven great patriots, most of whom had either been murdered by the Austrians in 48 or who came to other tragic uh, ends. And um, these, they're, sort of, they're very dark pieces, but they represent this wonderful uh, bridge between Liszt and WC Liszt and Bartok. Um, Liszt is such an incredible sort of innovator and, and uh, uh, a man of culture. In a way, you know, going back to what we started with, with Uninsky, in a way his model, and Uninsky talked a great deal about Liszt, was Liszt, who was this inc not only perhaps the greatest pianist who ever lived, right. but also this incredible man of culture who had in his class many American students. Uh, I was just reading that on the 4th of July he had a party with fried chicken and apple pie, <laughs> which moved me, moved me very, very much, actually. Yes, of uh, course. Uh, um, so um, I, Liszt is such an incredibly fascinating, rich figure. I mean, part mystic, part charlatan, incredible man of culture, uh, researcher. Uh, he, he lived enough to have 20 Well, he lives. also knew everybody. He knew all the crown heads of Europe. Europe. He spoke all the languages, all the important languages mm -hmm. of Europe. He had lived in all those countries. Countries, spent he, lots of time, uh, that's right. He also was a man who actually felt very much uh, as though he had been deified. He had a great relationship to God. He became a very, very yeah. staunch Catholic. As you know, he, he had planned possibly to become a monk in his early years. Yeah, sure. That's right. So, and, yeah. uh, of course, he became an abbe yeah. and was, uh, never took was such the, culture. Never took the oath of chastity. Never right. took the oath of chastity, <laughs> absolutely. But one of the things that, that one, 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 of the reasons, one of the reasons I love having you at the festival is your knowledge of languages, your knowledge of culture, and the fact that you have given lecture recitals in German and Italian and French. You are fluent in all these languages. And you're also an authority on, on uh, Proust and uh, have <laughs> discussed this in, on very many occasions. That's right. This is one of the things that the festival is, is, is sort of creating this, this wonderful world atmosphere. And uh, we are lucky to have this webcast uh, around the world yeah. because uh, I think this, this sense of culture and New York being the head of the United Nations, of course, mm -hmm. is, is being able to bring all of this. And uh, tell me a little bit more about your Beethoven, your Mozart, okay. and all the uh, things that you're doing. In a way, the program, most of the program, except for the Beethoven, is in, about the fascination of f f the f exotic cultures. Mozart writing a Turkish sonata, because it's not just the march that's Turkish. It's, it's uh, there are other Turkish elements in the other two movements, too. And because it was very much the, f the fashion in Vienna at the time. It's a very popular sonata. It still is a popular sonata. So I'm playing the A major Mozart sonata. I'm playing two other kinds of lists. Um, patriotic or, or nationalistic music, the one of the, t the twelfth Hungarian Rhapsody, which of course is a wonderful well, barn burner, yes. a magnet, pot, yeah, one of your pot boilers, yeah. yes. and then the Spanish, and Rhapsody, the Spanish Rhapsody, which is a very interesting piece because it's not an early work like most of the virtuoso pieces; it's a rather relatively late work, and, and it uses the theme of La Folia, La Folia, of course, which famous, of course is from Lully and Corelli, and all the way, all the way back up to Rachmaninoff and God knows who else. And uh, no, it's 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 actually, a, and then I'm playing Beethoven Opus 101. Well, the wonderful Beethoven Sonata, who's who, who, 
who the uh, one, one all the, the temple things. markings are in German, which are which is a wonderful thing. Etwas lebhaft and all these wonderful in, in, in things. In extra Empfindung. In Empfindung and then uh, and then yeah. mit, uh, Entschlossenheit right, and all the all other these great and things. all the great things. Right. But uh, one of the first uses of the fugue, where he has actually become uh, fascinated yeah. with Bach and Handel. Yes. Uh, why don't you comment on that? Because well, that's it's such an important part that's of Beethoven's very, development. Very, this well, this piece is if if not late Beethoven exactly, it's very, very much transitional towards late Beethoven. And one of the most important aspects of late Beethoven is this extraordinary um, increase in the interest in polyphony. Fugues, of course, there's the big fugue in the last movement, but polyphony everywhere. All four, well, three of the four movements are just jam-packed with polyphonic writing. Well, yes, which the first would, movement especially, of oh, course. Oh, yes, it's like a string quartet, and which, of course, he's heading toward. His last works were string quartets. And, and um, it's just an astonishingly rich difficult it's one of the most difficult pieces ever written it's, it's, as I you know it's one of those pieces you approach as an artist with what the Germans say air forced with with awe and and fear in a way but with such love it's so great it's such an honor and privilege to be able to play music as great as that like as Opus 101 or I mean any of the great Beethoven sonatas how do you regard the enigmatic march which uh is in some ways replaces the scherzo in sonata form. How do you regard that? First, the air is one of the most difficult movements ever written. Of course. <laughs> um, but polyphi polyphonic and polyphonically is polyphonically, yes. and with this very strange trio, with the with the the, the absolute canon, um, I, I think that that it's a, a fantastic example of Beethoven's ability in his late period to create at the same time two very contrasting states. Because on the one hand, of course, it's it's got it's a march. It's extremely rhythmic and very stately, and and, and but at the same time, it's also extremely energetic and, and energetic and, and, and it is somewhat scherzando. Yes, also. at the same time, very much. And so. then at the same time, it has these sudden changes of mood and changes of atmosphere, where just like all of a sudden he finds extraordinary beauty in the simplest material. So it's it's, it's a magnificent piece. Yes. Well, then you have also something similar to the Waldstein Sonata in the slow movement as well. Yes. A very short, short very brief, brief, but in this case, very dental, tr very transcendental, tragic. and and very interesting too is Beethoven's first specific use of una corda. The entire short slow movement is is, is to be played mit einer Seite with one chord. And whether or not one literally does that, I do. But he's looking for very special sonorities. That's a, another characteristic well, a very, of late Beethoven. It's there. It's there in each. Yes. Yes, very extremely very, inward very music, very and, inner, very and, 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 and he uses the word "I," as you also know, and, that, and that glorious re recapitulation, yeah, that a reference to the first movement, first movement before right. he goes into his his fugue. Right. When he comes back and yes. it sort of asks, and that of course also um, forecasts the, the Ninth Symphony. Remember the last movement of the Ninth yes, Symphony? He course. goes back over the movements and rejects yes. them and goes on to Absolutely. something new. He does this like, he's saying, well, will I go back to the first one? No, I'm going to go to this. And of course the few, the last movement is so joyous after the, the sadness of the slow movement. Okay. We're about to start uh, the second half of the program with Magdalena Brzezewska and uh, the, the, the performance of the Goldberg Variations on the piano, which hopefully will be just as revealing as the performance on the harpsichord. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Good night. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you.
Thank you.